guys. You take an earlier apex to carry more speed, and then you can outbreak the bloke on the left going into the next corner which Damon didn't quite do famously against Michael Schumacher in 95. There's something about it that always produces something unusual. Like anything for me that was off the public road was just a, a canvas on which you can paint fun. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode Number 60, Chris Cooper, the nicest man amongst us, tells us that's a diamond anniversary. So well done to us. Amazing. Um, first topic this week, what's your favourite race circuit and why? Okay. Uh, I'm going to go straight to... Edward Lovett. Hopefully I don't kill it for everyone else. There's so much to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's got to be Silverstone. Yeah. That, that, that's it. That's my choice for a few reasons. Number one, as a boy, I used to go with my father and watch the Grand Prix there every year. Nice. Um, so that was always a treat going to a to a real Grand Prix. But in my later years, not going there and watching it. I think it's one of the best races on the TV. There's normally always a race there, which no. if you're if you're watching Formula One, you do want there to be a mm. real race going on. Um, my only caveat would be I would I think I want Bridge back. Bridge yeah. was a brilliant corner. Yeah. Um, a brilliant corner to watch and a brilliant corner to drive. Yeah. That's that cool. When it explode from the darkness of the tunnel. And then suddenly take the next ride. It was. It was just. It was so fast, wasn't it? Visually, it was. Yeah, I'm not. Did, did they get rid of it to extend this? They did. They want to make the lap longer. Or yeah. Well, yeah. It was when they when they built the new wing section. Yeah. On the Sir Lewis Hamilton Street, as you get down that towards the new Abbey, that which is a glorious corner itself. I have to say, we haven't lost everything because that new Abbey. In lots good. of the, anything from a Caterham to a GT3 FIA car with lots of aero, bloody good corner. But just as you start to think about the right, the old circuit went to the left, so we'll never use again because there's buildings and grandstands there. So it's still there; you can walk on it. People are, will people go to Grand Prix racing will see it. But it's kind of marooned now. The track's still there. The bridge over it is still there. The curbing is still there, and you walk it and you think. That was a mega, mega corner. It was quite technical because of what followed. And do you do that sort of a diving? Do you take an earlier apex to carry more speed? And then you can outbreak the bloke on the left going into the next corner, which Damon didn't quite do famously against Michael Schumacher in 95. I was oh, just lovely. I saw that. Yeah. Silverstone's a great choice. Also, do you think yeah, there's, the left... there's some, there is some great footage, actually, some historical F1 footage going through there. And, and that, that Damon piece was, was one of them. Yeah. Do you think do you think that bridge was helpfully cambered? Because you could always carry more speed through it than you thought, couldn't you? Yeah. If if if, if the the following left was Priory, is that right? Uh, was, was Priory, the yes, left Priory the... then Brooklands, then Lucky. Yeah. yeah. So so in my from my memory, you could bridge, you were always a bit, Jesus Christ, I could have gone even faster. I thought yeah. I'd really pin yeah. that. And then Priory was cr was crowned a bit differently, so it would understeer a bit. So you sort of, it was helpful that the circuit designers had helped you in the really, really, really quick ballsy one. You have more grip, and then the one yeah. afterwards, it just crowned a bit. It was one of those. I think that's right. And it was one of those classic corners where, because there's a bridge parapet, as you come out of the old club chicane, um, that chicane between club, depending on which circuit you were using, as you went over the brow approaching bridge, because of the parapet there, you can't see the exit. And your mind tells you any corner, cops is a bit like that because it's such a tight apex. You can't see the exit. Your brain says to you, oh, I'm not sure, even though you've been around yeah. it a million times. So you'd always, you quite often get through bridge thinking, well, I could have carried a bit more speed there. A little yeah. bit of camber. It's just lovely. So, yeah, I think Silverstone's a brilliant choice. A few people have told themselves they can carry a bit more speed through cops and have regretted that <laughs> decision. Yeah, not me. 
<laughs> uh, so Edward Lovett says Silverstone. None of us disagree. Um, uh, Manish, what's your favourite circuit? I mean, this is based um, really on television, obviously, more than anything else. I mean, I, I love, very, very difficult to argue with Silverstone, by the way. And I think there's a good Frank Williams quote, you know, about it, he, you know, a little bit dated and sexist now, but he says it's a real man's circuit. That's what he used to call it. And um, that the, makes total sense why I chose it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, think, I think, you know, the modern translation of that would be it's a real driver's circuit. And I like any circuit that's a real driver circuit because what you're really saying, as Chris so beautifully put it just now, that there are lots of interpretations, lots of ways of taking corners. It's not just one line, one set of marbles. And it means drivers can make a difference. And for me, the other circuit that's like that is actually Suzuka. I think, you know, it, I, I was addicted to um, Jeff Crammon's Grand Prix Fall. I remember buying a Momo steering wheel, proper pedals, <laughs> and learning as many of those circuits as I could. And I used to spend ages in, I think, a pre-addict's way setting up cars. And um, so, you know, you, you try all kinds of things at places like Monaco, very, very interesting. Silverstone, absolutely fantastic. But there was something about Suzuka there's something about it that always produces something unusual, always, you know, the, the drivers come to the fore. And I'd say when I used to drive it with good old Gref, Jeff Kramer, it was the Degna corners that I found absolutely fantastic. You could do the first one almost flat, second one you'd get exactly right. You'd always get on the curve, you could spin the car, no problem. And got those two wrong, you got the hairpin completely wrong, and suddenly you'd lost half a second. And I, I was just saying, you know, segue into this this weekend's Grand Prix, and we were talking about it. The uh, the driver who's not too short on praise for himself, rather praised himself, saying P5 was completely out of position given the car. We are maybe the best, best car. <laughs> so you have Alonso, you know, planting that car in, was, was he sixth in qualifying and fifth in the race? Yeah, sixth, yeah. It was unbelievable. I mean, just that, that's, Pretty spectacular in yeah. that car. Uh, I mean, you know, and and I would say the other, the great thing about Suzuka for me, just great childhood memories. First time I saw that circuit, Senna and the banana yellow Lotus. He wins his world championship there. He um, gave one to Berger there. He took Prost off there. Prost took him off there. So just in terms of kind of, you know, drama, Suzuka, and I got up for it, by the way. You know, I didn't get up for Australia, but there was no way I was not going to get up for the Japanese Grand Prix, even mm. though it was round four, so Japan. That's another good call. I And I think I remember getting up for the 94 Japanese Grand Prix. Oh, when well, it was that raining. famous two-part Grand Prix oh, in the wet. Nuts. And da Damon was interviewed this weekend, and he still says... I, I just had an out-of-body experience that weekend. I just drove at a level I've never driven before. And that's when I, I still think that was just one of the most amazing races. And so, yeah, Suzuka, I think, is. And it does prove one thing. In one respect, Scale Extrix is cool. <laughs> yeah, it's figure cool. of figure of eight circuits are cool. Yeah. By the way, did you see Schumacher shook his hand? And there was nothing contrived about that. After that race, Damon's in the cockpit. You see Schumacher come up to him, he just shakes his hand. Yeah. Because it's like, mate. That was quite cool. That was your race. Wow. No Clifford. Oh, I wish I wish I had your brains, you guys, because A, I don't like circuits. <laughs> be, be it that I obviously like looking at them. I don't like being on them, I suppose, to contact. That's okay. That's just as important. Yeah. To but context to that. And and B, I don't... I've watched Formula One for 20 or 30 years. You know, I really love Formula One because it's cars and it's people and it's handsome, fabulous, wonderful women and men and it's sexy. And I couldn't tell you anything about any of the circuits. They all look the same to me. I think, <laughs> I, you know, my brain has done me quite well in life, but there's, there's a bit missing <laughs> when it comes, to, it comes to remembering circuits, even though I've been to Silverstone maybe 10 or 20 times on track days, the minute I drive out of that pit, I have no idea if it's left or right. Well, that's OK. I mean, you love you love Goodwood as a... <clears throat> well, look, if, if you wouldn't mind not answering my question, 
Um, <laughs> Um, even though I'm I here to help, help. I am here um, all day. My favourite circuit is Goodwood, um, and and it's my favourite circuit mainly because I love watching vintage racing there, and it's you know I, I adore the place. It's local to me as a kid. You know I grew up in Portsmouth. Um, I've got a photo of my myself. Where the hell is it now? Hold on a second. A photo of me. When it was derelict in 1977. Yeah. Oh wow. And my, you know, we used to. My brother, my brother rallied a Mark One Escort, and we could just, you could just drive in there. It was full of brambles, barbed wire. It's me sat on, you know, one of those sort of 70s cagoules and my flares and my sort of Clark's attackers with a compass in the sole. Um, so for me, I have a huge passion for Goodwood. It's mainly for me about watching people, seeing lovely people, meeting lovely people. We're all there for members meeting this weekend. So even though I don't like being on circuits, I do love circuits. I think the, yeah, the answer for dr yeah. driving and watching are probably very different for most people. You, you oh, know, it's completely, like, yes. Completely, yeah. It's one of I those much prefer watching. stories, isn't it? It's a, you know, it's how does Britain have some derelict circuit with a stately home, 20 years later, it becomes something that absolutely everyone... Oh, it's genius. About cars. And you only have to spend five account. minutes in the company of, um, of, um, of lovely Charlie March to realise what a bloody genius he is, how he's done yeah. that. You know, obviously, you know, he's got a few Bob and but he's got a massive brain and a lot of energy and a lot of drive. And, you know, he's got, you know, a lot of OCD and a lot of passion. And he's done a, such a masterful job. It's just bloody fantastic, that place. Yeah. We're so lucky to have it on our doorstep. Yeah. Here, here. Um, Chris Cooper, we'd like to answer the question for yourself now. No, I'd like Neil to answer it, actually, <laughs> in the spirit of... Spirit of oh, OK, uh, Spa, when I was in a caterham... Oh, he's, oh, he's done you, you there. See, we know each other oh, so well. No, he's, he's done you there. He's done you there. So, it's not... It, I was going to say it's not the Nürburgring, because it's kind of all Nordschleife. Um... There are two, there are lots of answers to this question, which is why I kind of, you know, my instinct was Neil. But you love there's you don't have to be a driver to love a circuit. You yeah. don't have to know which way they go. Yeah. And your love of Goodwood for those reasons is just as strong and important as Chris and mine's love of the line you take at Bridge. It, yeah. It's it's different but the same. Um, the Nordschleife is a love hate relationship particularly for me, before Monkey jumps in and starts showing pictures of various broken cars, I've left littering most of southwest Germany. <laughs> um, I mean, it's the Everest of our sport. Yeah. Every other circuit is that little, little rolling hill somewhere in Somerset in comparison to Everest. You never, and, you know, honestly, I've probably had a few, full, few falls there because you thought, I'm going to see if I can climb higher, see how high I can get. And it goes wrong because it's the kind of place where it will go wrong. So although I love it, and we're going to talk a little bit later about long journeys in cars. And one of the things I loved about it was the camaraderie and the long journeys in a car from here to there and back again, hopefully on the way back, not without a broken car and total silence in the car where everyone was thinking, what do we say to Chris now he's broken another car? Um, but, it, but, in, but in terms of... I do love Spa. I love Spa because as a driver, it's, it's still somewhere, although I sort of loved it in its last incarnation when the bus stop was literally a bus stop. Most people know the bus stop is called, what's called a bus stop because pre-99-2000, a lot of it's still public road and that was a bus stop. Buses stopped there. The new one I don't like so much. I sort of, it's just too fiddly. I know why they've had to do it, but it's too fiddly. But the one before, it was this quite unique combination of quite technical, but utter bravery, particularly at Eau Rouge, where mm. but not just Eau Rouge, but Pouon, Blanchemont before the runoff and all those kind of things. So as somewhere to express yourself and to feel the car flow, 
It's quite hard to top spa. Cadwell Park, that's amazing. First time I went to Cadwell Park, when I started my first year of catering racing, we got, it's in the middle of nowhere, it's a beautiful part of Lincolnshire. Most people think Lincolnshire is quite flat, but the Lincolnshire world's a beautiful, really lovely, rolling, beautiful mm. rural country. First time we got there, and there was a pathway. We parked in the paddock, which was grass in those days, walked past a couple of little sheds. There's a little pathway thinking, oh, this must be the pathway that leads to the circuit. And after a few moments, we realized, no, this is the circuit. <laughs> it's really, really narrow, <laughs> yeah. really twisty, trees and stuff everywhere. People <laughs> described it as the mini Nürburgring, which is slightly optimistic. I mean, it's, it's nothing. But it, to have it on our doorstep, if you've never, even just to go there and visit it, and w- watching the bikes go over the mountain, the first part of the mountain, where they literally take off, I saw something this week of a GT3 Porsche taking off. So to go and watch motorsport and the vehicles that we love, bikes for cars, and mm, nice. well. I've never been there. Yeah, it's just, mm. there's nothing like it in the UK. So we could talk all day, all, all day, all week about favourite circuits. It's a bit like, who's your favourite friend and what's your favourite car? It's just so many different answers. Mm. Um, I like all the answers everyone's given. I think uh, they're, they're all, it's like walking into somebody who's breeding Labradors. I love all of them. I'll take all <laughs> of them. I just cut, cut out there. What did you say about Labradors? <laughs> he loves all of them apparently i'll take them all yeah home. i think that's a good analogy that there we go somehow we've gone from the north to dog bothering in four minutes well done chris cooper um i'll start he's he started off with a negative statement i'll do the same um it's not spa um and i'll tell you why because i'm <laughs> shit because i'm shit there I think that's the. I've got a thing about circuits. I can't really say I love a circuit unless I'm all right at driving around it. Why do you think your shit there? Never had any. I've never had any luck. I've never been any good. Never been. Oh, that's different. Luck's a different thing. I've I've never been very fast there. I just. uh, I don't really. I don't really. I'm all right in an old car, but I'm not really very good there. But I agree with Chris Cooper. When it had, when there was, when O Rouge presented some sort of a risk, Blanchemont used to be horrific because you could. As you turned in, the bloody barrier was about a yard to your right, and you were like, "Oh my!" There's a lot of wake-up calls, and the uh, and the uh, Puyol. I can remember the first time I raced there. What two thousand? No, first time I raced there. Uh, God, that makes me feel old. The um, I went off in in free practice at Puyol onto the onto the gravel, and it wasn't gravel. I remember getting out of the car. It was like it was like chunks this big. I thought, "Yeah, oh, earth I've thought, done that." Bloody terrifying. So it's not. It's not it's not spa for me. Oh, first of all, I need a massive shout out to America because <sighs> at the first time I went and yeah. I spent any time on American race circuits, I had this awfully jaundiced European view that it was all about U- European circuits and we were better and they just drove around around in circles uh, on ovals. And then I went to do a job at Watkins Glen. Yeah. And wow. Yeah. Like we, if we bemoan old circuits, or as Manish quite rightly quoted Frank Williams, real man circuit, terrible phrase now, I know. They fit the criteria now, even now. There's not much runoff. The barriers are old, and there are high consequences. So shout out to America. For me, Watkins Glen. Road America. Uh, road America. Road Atlanta. Road Atlanta. Yeah. A fast road car. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. What yeah. a circuit. Uh, Sebring. Go to Sebring for the six hours during spring break weekend. We talk about a combination of challenging circuit and atmosphere. I'm not sure you can, you know, I just loved it. However, um, in the UK, Silverstone, absolutely love. But I, I'm not sure there's a UK circuit that I really don't enjoy driving around. I think that's maybe where, I, where I'd want to leave this. But I have to choose one. Any circuit. <laughs> is a place where you can express yourself in a way that you can't on the road. Yeah. You, if you and, I, and I've spent a lifetime trying to make places that aren't that exotic look exotic to the cameraman. So if you gave me one corner of asphalt in a farmer's garden that he'd put down for some reason to as hard standing, I would go there and do a skid in 30 yards with a photographer and, and make the car look super exciting for the front of Evo magazine. Mm. And that, by definition, meant that anything for me that was off the public road was just a canvas on which you can paint fun. So I love, if you just give me any circuit, that's why, special shout out to Landau, 
everyone that comes to Landau or sees Landau goes, well, you know, it's just, it's just, an, it's just an oval. No, it's not. It's a place mm -hmm. where I, that circuit can expose the fault of any chassis of any car I've ever driven. And uh, and I and I love the fact that it's close to me, and I love Landau. So, mm. however, I have to disagree with Chris Cooper. The greatest of all for me is the Nurburgring because it it's just got everything really. And I and I, the reason I choose the Nurburgring is I spent several minutes yesterday evening trying to persuade myself that it wasn't the Nurburgring, and and that in itself is futile. Yeah, so that's what I did. I had to persuade myself that it wasn't means I was talking utter bobbins, and it is. Yeah. So. It's uh, it's it's a remarkable uh, piece of asphalt, and I know it changes, and it so people get say so it gets easier. But the first time you go there, and you might have seen it on games or on videos, but the first time you go there, you'll you'll drive out, and you'll be a minute into it, and your and your brain will be thinking, "Wow, it's still going," and then, and then your brain will think, "Did they really race Formula One cars here?" So that you just ask yourself a series of questions that don't have obvious answers. Yeah, so amazing. I think that is that is a good that's a good eulogy to the ring. There are Labrador puppies in other parts of the world. Bathurst in Australia. <laughs> I take that one home. It's not a permanent circuit though, is it? Bathurst. Um, bits of it. Are. It's a bit like an old spa. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, mm. Here we go. Moving on to an even more thorny issue. Hmm. Probably the wrong word. What's your favourite armrest? Centre armrest in a car. One second. Get some answer. Oh, I'll tell you what. Neil Clifford. <laughs> I've got a very good mate that really takes the piss rightly out of me that says, every bloody car you ever own or buy, it's always the fucking best one that's around. And um, you should work in PR. I should have worked in PR, actually. I suppose I have a little PR function in the company that I'm yeah, in. Yeah, you sort of do at the moment. Yeah, um, but, what you do no, but yeah, no, I, I do, I do, oh. I do. But, but uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm very good at self promoting, which is you know can be a bit narcissistic, really. But anyway, the um, I try to do it with humour. I've just bought a, a Range Rover L three two two, right? Um, I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago for nine grand. I've had a couple of them in the past when they were sort of more expensive and the supercharged one and all that, when black cars were cool. I can't believe I had a black one of those. It's the worst color. Yeah. But anyway, I've, got a, I've got a navy blue one now. And I drove it yesterday. And the interior, I know we're not talking about interiors, we're talking about armrest, is wonderful because the quality of it is actually much better than the newer ones. Just the feeling. Exactly. It feels like a disco four. It's sort of peak... Tonka toy robustness. And then you sit in that seat, which is all, it's a lovely armchair. It's super comfortable. It's got all the adjustment, the leather's not, but the armrest. You've got two armrests, really. You've obviously got the lovely little leather paddy square one that's got the lift up bit. But the key bit is that, and they have them on the disco threes and fours as well, don't they? That sticky out one that goes up and down. Yeah. And the key, the key bit of this is the little knob at the, the end. Early the early knob. The, the, little, rotary. the little rotary knob, because you can absolutely perfect it to like, you want it like seven degrees. You don't want it quite horizontal. You want yeah. to just have it like seven degrees. And the joy that that little gnarly knob brings, that you adjust it, to, you go, oh. <laughs> And the wife's been in it and it's a bit low or whatever. And you just adjust it up seven degrees just, and you're like, I'm ready to go now. That is perfect. It's so well-being. No, that is the definition of well-being. Yeah, it <laughs> is. And then you go to the petrol station, as I did yesterday at 4.45, because I still got bloody jet lag. And you fill up that tank. And it's a big tank. It's like 120 quid on that thing. All petrol's gone up and I haven't noticed again. It's probably back to two quid or whatever. And you... you, you I mean, you imagine if you could just adjust your prices on everything we sell, it'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? I mean, those <laughs> petrol stations take the piss, don't they? Oh, I'm going to put shoes up 20% this week, you know. You, you know, you could Go protect, on, give that a try. Tell us what protect, happens next week. You could protect your profits, couldn't you? But anyway, that big tank full up, huge joy. Adjust your little knob to six degrees. All six now, is it? Perfection, that armrest. Yeah, it's a winner. In have, you, have you checked your brake pads? Oh, 
that's another story. This should be called <laughs> this podcast should be renamed In Appreciation of the L322. Yeah, uh, it's really good. Yeah, I would love it. What's your favorite armrest? Because all the cars of your youth had armrests and cigarette lighters in the back. Yeah, exactly. I, the, do they call it? Do they call it an armrest in the back? It sort of was. I, I liked the one that with the crystal in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Good lad. I, I couldn't really think of one that that's um, that's even worth talking about. The, 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 I'm not sure if it was an L22, but does that? Does does that one slide as well? But not the um, no. not no. not the um, it's the not center bit, bit no. the middle bit. Does that does that slide no. open? There's one no. that, that, that there is a uh, there's a BMW that slides forwards. Yeah. I was trying to remember the car that you get into, and for some reason, every time you put your elbow on the center armrest, it wants <laughs> to slide forward. I think it was an E39 5 Series that did that. Oh, oh. It could have been the state of your well being or. Post-prandial hydration. No, well, I that might have caused a slight skiddage. You're saying he has sweaty elbows? No, I, I, it, it, was, it was it was a Friday built car. I think it was a Friday built <laughs> car. Okay, or, or it wasn't just a Friday. So well, I did, look, I, I, as a uh, I, we like the sweeties in the cars, as we, we we've talked about. So and and. Because I've got three children and a wife and some dogs, you know that the the centre armrest with sweeties in there is it, not is not one sweetie for me. It's sweeties for everyone now. Yeah. So it needs to be a, a rather palatial yes. armrest. So probably something from an Escalade that the, that you can open up and have a variety right. of uh, of sweeties in there that are air conditioned and chilled. Edward is onto something there. Also, I love the description of his family because I've got three children and a dog and a wife and a wife. Um, so um, he's quite right. I think I think an American air-conditioned, icy, massive glove box that's mm. big like mini's yeah. boot. When it, when you first see one of those, you go, "Wow, this is the future." Uh, let's go to uh, Manish Pandey. Um, I've got this thing about the interiors of cars and things like armrests with all their accoutrement, whether they're sort of knobs in the back that adjust your individual air conditioning or a great big hole in between the two of you with a bottle of Stolly Cristal in or whatever. They just all look like Emirates business stroke first class interiors, with, especially when they're that light leather. I hate them. I hate them. I just absolutely don't think a car should have any of that shit in it at all. And in fact, for me, this was actually one of the, the few answers. I, I had an immediate answer. Mm. That was Uncle Francis's old Rolls Royce Silver Shadow 2. And I loved, in the front, he had the double armrest. Double, so, yeah. So, you know, driver could have it down, or the passenger could have it down, the driver could have it up, the passenger could have it up. Just, just individually perfect. And in the back, basically a double bed between you the big one. and the passenger. Yeah. It was wide. You could both get your elbows on. You could, there'd, be two, there'd be two guys, Neil's size, and they're not fighting over the armrest. They've just got, they can literally, two six foot four inch guys with Popeye forearms, plenty of room each. Functional, beautiful, leather was immaculate. I remember he had dark blue leather inside. And it's uh, got that little uh, leather bit, little leather, belt at the end you could just, just flip like, it exactly. down with your finger little leather belt at the end yeah. Pull yeah. It up, pull it. just perfect functional none of this emirates here's a can of coca-cola here's a can of dr peppers <laughs> just get rid of it podcast yeah. of the people yeah <laughs> no, that's a good armrest chris cooper what's your favorite rolls royce armrest well i do have a um, armrest of the people answer mark seven golf yeah, yeah. mark seven golf it's yeah. got that. It's a, it's a slidey one, but that's what, also, that's what Evan was thinking of. It also has a tippy bit which you can lift up. It's got a little clever ratchet in it. Yeah, you lift it up, and it's it's not quite as satisfying. Well, it's not as satisfying as the knurly, those sort of little sort of the little knurly knobs, and you just instinctively know you get into range over which way do you knurl them mm. to raise or lower them. Left goes um, up. Left goes left, up. Left up. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the Mark Seven Golf armrest, I think, is the armrest of the people because it slides around. You can do it upy downy, and it will just hold itself in midair. It's just brilliant. It's just the 
for an everyday people's solution, I think Mark 7. I mean, the 322 is clearly, and the and there are other Range Rovers as well, but what, Neil, when you sent, sent those pictures, you and I were both up quite early that morning, whatever it was, and we were having a little little well-being sharing moment yeah. of that the architecture of that dash and those beautiful vertical pillars of wood which sort of pierce the structure of the dash and then reappear, which just sends a sense of huge solidity and structure. Yeah, and, and it, yeah it is solid as well. And confidence. And they've got those little captain, I think they're called captain's chairs armrests because they're sort of like a captain's like a boat. skipper's chair in a, in, a, in a maritime vessel. Yes. But yeah, so I think armrest of the people as a counterpoint to armrest of the hoi polloi, of the plutocrats, it would be Mark 7 Golf. Uh, I yeah. have to agree. In fact, there's a Mark 7 Golf that lurks within my broader family unit. And I'll tell you what's critical about this armrest. The Mark Seven, it's it's cloth, it's fiber in in uh, exactly, and it grips your elbow. If you get exactly. in it, if you get in a, le a leather one, and and your elbow slips on it, it, it's 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 like walking on ice. You don't want that. that. Is... You need some adhesion onto onto the, the fabric, or yeah. words, it counters the sweatiness of that elbow. Because if you've got very sweaty <laughs> elbows, like we know Edward has, you're like a, you're like an anti Prince Andrew, aren't you? Known to be sweating from the elbows. Um, so. Uh, all of these, I, I sort of get the three, two, two, one. My only problem with with these single armrests that come out of a, of a so called captain's chair is that they're quite they are by definition quite thin, and a thin armrest sort of refocuses the pressure onto your arm. You're aware that you're really pushing onto something because it's narrow. Yeah, the, wide, the wider the surface that you're leaning on. Then it feels more like you're just, you know, you're putting your elbow onto a large ottoman, and that, that for me is the sense of luxury. And therefore, you need to have a big, wide, American. Well, mostly American cars are amazing at it. Like you get into a suburban, yeah, you can tell that someone spent about thirteen minutes figuring out how it handles, and about seventeen months working out where if you touch anything, it, your your body will just bounce off it gently. Yeah, everything is, and they've just worked out where do you put your cup there. How, what will it be like in a 50 mile an hour right hander? Couldn't give a shit, but I can put my big gulp there and I know that it won't spill a drop while I'm doing it. For yeah. me, these are priorities that matter. Um, in Europe, the car I've, I've driven and it's got, and I'm experienced regularly, has the best armrest is, um, is my 200 series Land Cruiser. It's got, it can move forwards and backwards. It's so big. I mean, it's about, I mean, in, in soft furnishing terms, it would be a poof sitting on top of a box i mean it's about that wide it's wider than a seat in a mini i think <laughs> yeah. and because it is so old it's just broken down it's gone a bit soft and because the leather has just started to if it was leather it was more like lubber that sort of leathery rubber mixture they put in cars what's it mm -hmm. called lubber leather and rubber because that's what that's not we don't get leather really in cars there's no cow mm. lubber. i've now got an answer to a later question in our podcast okay um, in, my, in my industry it's called pleather is it okay right so you got lubber and it just because when lubber just breaks down it it becomes grippy doesn't it you know when you get in a car it before it actually actually disintegrates and they separate so now i've got this grippy surface in the car and i and it's soft and my elbow sits on it and i just think this is it's just joyous and mm -hmm. it, it's wide it spreads that pressure um i, I remember there was a this almost answer segues into what chris cooper's talking about a later question there's a, a, a guy that, so I mentioned it before, a guy that uh, has a garage near uh, where I used to live called Chris Clinker. It's a place called um, Parva Cars. And I oh, remember, yes. I remember him pointing out to me that Mercedes Benzes thought about your right elbow as well in a right hand drive car. He used to hate BMWs. There was no padding for your right elbow, but Mercedes Benzes surfaces were always padded on the right elbow. And, he, and I got in a car recently, I thought he was right. He's right. He's, Germans. He's right. But but the BMWs don't, and Audis, very, Audis have a little bit of padding. It's a bit mean. But Mercedes-Benz is thinking about your right elbow as well as your left elbow. It's true. Yes. Yeah, BMWs stuff. are for driving. That's why they don't. And Audis are shit. That's why they yeah. don't. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, so, yeah, I, I but I do think a good centre armrest. It's amazing. If you watch someone get into a luxury car, 
the first thing they'll do is is play with the armrests. They always they'll get in and go, and they'll move they'll move them up and down, they'll move them around. That before they even press buttons, the armrest is the priority. Yes. Um, long drives, something that all of us as addicts love. Do you prefer doing them solo or with an person or I suppose multiple persons? Are you sociable or are you a solitary creature? Uh, Chris Cooper. Well, this is where I do love the Nurburgring. I just noticed in the notes that Finn and Cam shared with me, because we talked about, we had this conversation, why isn't it the Nurburgring? And Finney said to me, isn't it a bit reductive for us to say the Nurburgring is our favourite circuit? I had to go and look up what that meant. I'm going to now. Yeah. Um, I love long drives with passengers and by myself. First time I drove to the ring for a race meeting, 2001, I drove by myself. And it was just such a voyage of discovery and adventure. Eurotunnel, France, Belgium, Germany. It was just wonderful. And I also enjoyed and I loved, and that was a big part of it, really big part of it, was, Chris, the drives that we had to the ring with Guy Spur um for our racing there all those years um so i think both one of the, the boys said to me one of the and you know we all know this a long drive in a car particularly if it's just two of you you end up having a conversation you'd never have in any other circumstance in any other time that's true yep uh and funny reminded me of that last night he said a long drive with one other person in the car you, you have the conversation you never have any other time and and i I think that's just totally true. And I love mm. that. There's just the it's, rhythm of the, the conversation. It's the therapist's chair, isn't it? It is. That, well, there, and there are two therapists' chair in the front of the car. And I think the most, it, it sounds, this sounds really sycophantic, but do you remember, Chris, the first time you and I sat in a car together? It was a Mitsubishi Evo 7. Oh, yes. yes. And we drove it from, it's when you and I pretty much first met. And I blagged it from Mitsubishi for a four day UK road test and drove it straight to the Nürburgring. Sorry, yeah. to the, sorry to the Colt car company. I might've been a bit of a mischievous there. Yeah. <laughs> They're out of business, don't worry. Yeah, sad that, isn't it? It's all gone. So we drove from Teddington, the auto car offices, um, via Flexi Plus, yeah. which is when you discovered I was your real friend because yes. I would always upgrade Eurostar to Flexi Plus. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't? Um, and we then drove all the way to, and we had such a. We just talked about everything. Well, we I wouldn't have got to. I wouldn't have got to know you as quickly if we'd sat on an aeroplane together, or if we'd sat on a train. So no, yeah. there's something about the car environment that for it forces things to happen one way or the other. You know very quickly whether you're going to go down the silence Haribo fiddle with radio route, or whether you're going to talk. Don't yeah. you? Yeah. Very quickly, and if it's yeah. the former. And you think we've got ten hours here? This is going to be a struggle. Yeah, they, and we—they always seem when we—I've talked mentioned this before. When you and I were, went to the Paul Ricard for that training day, yeah, yeah, another manufacturer's press car that turned out not to spend the whole weekend in the UK either. That uh, was it. RLG. He, uh, that was uh, not Hebe. XLG. 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 <laughs> um, we drove back. We spent the morning at the ring. As, Paul Ricard, learning it, bosh, done, thought, let's just go home. So we just drove in one hit from Ricard, left midday, got back to your tunnel early evening, and we just talked the whole way. It's quite a noisy car to talk in. Uh, and we listened to stuff on the radio, we listened to stuff on Spotify, we listened to John Finnemore's Cabin Pressure, a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's just a, a journey of showing, hey, I've got this thing, you'd, you'd like this. Well, actually, you, you can't. It was just so long journeys. And they work with families. So when the boys and I go down to Cornwall, beginning of the summer, we'll take the Defender. And the three of us will go in the Defender. And we'll just chat the whole way about stuff we want to do, people we're going to see in Cornwall in the summer, just everything. It's just long drives are good. <laughs> That's yeah. true. In support of long drives. Neil Clifford, what do you think? I'm so torn on this because that was such a wonderful answer. Mr. Cooper, and, and you're, you're dead right. You've, you've swayed me a bit, actually, because I was absolutely 100% I'd rather be on my own. 
but you've just convinced me that actually some journeys you do long with people are really really nice so i think i think it's very very thoughtful of you i i get anxiety about long drives if i'm going because there's, there's there's a few different facets to this isn't it long drive completely on your own on your own long drive with other people in different cars and long drives with people in one car yeah um <clears throat> frankly they're all better than not doing any of it <laughs> <laughs> so even a shit one's good really it's a bit like it's a, no i can't use that analogy so the um <clears throat> i get anxiety if i'm going uh, on a long drive and i've got to meet people and we're meeting at a certain point I get massive anxiety about my own timing. I'm normally there 45 to 50 minutes earlier than I should be because I'm so worried about being late. Yeah. And then I'm worried for them being late. And then I'm worried for them about breaking down, about my own anxiety about breaking. So this is it's quite a stressful. I'm joyful. I'm happy. I'm positive. I'm not at work. I'm doing something, you know, good for myself, whatever. But I have massive anxiety about it. I do, I do really like getting in the car and just saying, and I do this often on a Friday to the frustration of other people in the company, I'm just going to drive to Manchester today and I'm going to show up in Manchester, I'm going to show up in Edinburgh. Or, and I love that. I do love that yep. 4.15 alarm, little coffee, chat to the dog, sun's coming up even though I'm going to get there at 7.45 and the shops don't open till 10, I've got a logic why that was a clever thing to do because I'm just up and gone. And I love that. I love the Radio 4 thing, Radio 5, Radio 4. It's where I think, it's where I have ideas. I've never really had a good idea in this bloody office, frankly. Um, certainly after two o'clock, I might as well go home. But in a car early, I'm really clever. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love all know, of that. Yeah. So I, I like all of it. I like it with people, without people, on my own, not on my own. Sometimes people in a car thing, I get more worried about that just because, oh, my God, what am I going to talk about? Will you know, am I going to be entertaining enough? Am I going to look after people? I worry about other people too much sometimes. It sounds like I'm a nicer person than I actually am, but I do have anxiety for others. So it's, it's quite a complicated subject, this. It is. It is. I love that that bit about the anxiety of you've got a group. I'm, it's going to happen to me this weekend, actually, going down for the members meeting at Goodwood. There'll be part of the weekend. We'll have a number of different people in the car. And I'm already anxious over will oh. they all know where to meet? Will they be there on time? Because Neil and I, we are so different in so many ways, but we are 100% aligned on on time is late. Early is not quite early enough. Very early is on time. Yeah. I've almost got stomach cramps of anxiety for others. Yes, exactly. And I, I it's know weird. exactly what you feel like when you say that. I can only laugh at that last bit. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the good thing is that, Neil Clifford, on this show, you can have it all. So there you go. Have it all. Manage Pandy, uh, solo or, or multi-partner? Um, being driven solo. That's actually my favourite thing. Long journey, <laughs> Good being on. driven by somebody who's paid to drive me so I don't need to talk to them. Because I find exactly like Neil, it's a fantastically productive time. And there's something about <laughs> being driven in a car when you've got a longish journey. Long journey, I would define here as over two hours. So two hours plus is a long journey. One mm -hmm. hour, it's a, it's a train, it's whatever. And being alone, especially in the back of that car, is fantastically productive. And I, what, I'm terrible at reading in the back of the car, having an iPad in the back of the car, having a visit, so I can't do any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I get a little bit of motion sickness doing that. But if you're just sitting in the back of the car, being driven to a, you know, a destination more than two hours away, I find it literally, it's almost zen-like how productive you can be. Go in there with 10 problems, Three in screenwriting, two in film production, one in casting, five in scheduling, and one legal. And you come out of that journey, and they're all solved. So nice. being yeah. driven in the back of a car. Can I send you some of mine next time you're on a long journey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Edward. Solo. 
<laughs> not, not Edward. Yeah, that's, all you, not. that's all you need to know about EFL. They, in yeah. one word. Uh, I've even written here, I'm so, even when I've got others in the car, I'm still solo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think I get anxiety, but I don't particularly like dwelling. And so if I, if I know which service station I want to use, I know how much fuel I'm either going to have to conserve to get there. And, and I'm talking sort of cross Europe, et cetera. So I, I know I want to get to that specific um, service station because it's got the better coffee or the better sandwich. And I know where the toilet is. So I'm going to fill it up. And then when there's five people that get out of the car and they want to, you know, go and look at some chocolates and take the dog for a wee and stuff like that, I, I, that's, I get anxious once it's full and I've had my coffee and my sandwich and I just want to go, actually, I eat the sandwich on the go as well. Clearly, you can't, um, you can't just sort of hover around eating it before you get in the car. Um... But I also, I just, I, I, I guess anxious is the wrong word. But I want to listen to what I want to listen to, and I don't particularly want to apologise for it. And I don't want to feel like, am I? Are we listening to this because I want to listen to it? Are they, are they sat over there now, annoyed that I'm listening to what I yeah. want to listen to? Yeah. We use words like um, solicit, solicit. Easy, solip, you say. Solipsistic. Solipsistic. <laughs> what is solipsistic, Manish? Solipsistic. Solipsistic. Love it. What is solipsistic? That is being so intensely into yourself, you don't know that the world exists outside you. <laughs> well, I could, uh, I might get a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Neil, nice knowing you, Manish. To make me a hat, please. Jesus <laughs> Christ, give, give him a hug, Manish. Um, I think, um, I think I've inadvertently opened a whole can of worms with this oh, one. Oh, this, massive. This, this, is yeah. a window, this is a window into personalities, isn't it? So... I can embrace all of these. I'm also going to split the difference and be lily livered and say maybe the perfect journey is the one where you drive there on your own and back with your mates or with a oh. mate. So you get so you get both experiences. Well, well, that's a good that's a good point. But if you were going there and back, would you want to go there with your mates and back alone or vice versa? Oh, good. I'd point. probably do the, I'd do the I'd do the former. I'd go with people and come yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. Please. I'd probably crash the car when we're there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I, there, I mean, there are arguments on, on all sides here. I love, I, I now realise, as, as, as Neil Clifford was talking, there are good car buddies and bad car buddies, and they don't necessarily square with how close your real friends friendships are outside of the car. Mm. I know people who are really good car buddies who I find a bit irritating outside of the car, but inside of the car they get it. But I've got really good friends that when they're in the car are frankly fucking annoying. And I don't want them in the car, but outside of it, I love them. So Chris Cooper doesn't fit through those character categories. I can assure you, he's he 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 hits both bases. But I, I think a car conversation that goes well in the right car, where there's a shared experience, where both of you leave the journey or get out of the car and think, "Wow, I really enjoyed that," is one of without wanting to come across as being overly romantic. It's a really special moment, and when yeah. it happens. You, you yeah. remember it, and you, and you have a totally different view of that place, that motor vehicle, and that person. Um, it's good it goes, with children. It's a good place to talk to oh, kids. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree with you. So, yeah. so uh, all of us will talk about. Oh, when I was a kid in the car, we didn't wear seatbelts. I used to sit in that. But I used to. I, ever would say I used to sit in that bit in the Phantom Five between the three, two front seats, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> and I. And I, I totally get. I mean, I remember. I always remember being wedged in the back of a three series, going up to Heathrow with two suitcases on my lap and one in the side there. I like to paint those as being great times. I was dragged out of bed at three in the morning, and no one fucking spoke to me. But I still want to paint them as being positive times. Actually, they were hideous. They were probably abusive. Um, so I think. But but I my working life. If I look back on on what I what I did for a living, if you can call it that, twenty five something years ago, more than that. Actually, the great privilege was was the journeys. I just love them. Mm. Uh, I love the fact that some of the stories I have people to corroborate and other ones I don't. 
And I, 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 I used to love getting lost in Europe. It was what I did professionally. There was no sat nav. I had a, I had a, I had a map book for each country that I bought from Germany because the German mapping was always best. So I used to buy map books of, Ger of, of Europe in German service stations. And I'd head off with some money and I'd just get lost. I'd have nothing booked. And the sense of liberty. Oh, it's lovely. On a, on a solo road trip. And if I, if I don't have anxiety, as you guys have expressed it, it's the fact that you don't have to answer for your shitness to anyone. So you don't have to get to Eurotunnel and explain that you didn't book it. You don't have to you don't have to say it's 11 at night. Actually, you're right. There isn't a hotel booked. You can sleep in the car. You can, you know, your colon can do exactly what it wants. All these <laughs> things are, are, are very liberating. But but the flip side is that with people, and Neil, Neil's quite right, family have I love, I love wandering around with my children. I love the nonsense conversations we have. Yeah. And I love, also, I love randomly picking on, on people in a lovely way. So, you know, if my daughter's asleep, I'll just, I'll, I'll wake her up and I'll, and I'll, and I'll just start going at her for some, for some reason, about, about something really puerile until she just tells me to shut up. Also, another thing about a road trip that's really important if you're with the kids, the dog. I oh, love, yeah. The dog is the focal point because my, my previous dog was big and had to stay in one place. But this dog, I know... You're not supposed to do this, but this one, this one likes in the Land Cruiser, three row seats. He likes to roam around, and he like he chooses this person to sit with for a bit. And everyone spends three or four hours talking about what the dog's doing. He's yeah. just his focal point. What's he doing now? Look at that. That's weird. Do you think he's stupid? Do you think he's clever? What? It, so, and I all this stuff I absolutely love. So I, you I can't I, forgive the dog's colon in the car though. That when you're <laughs> trapped in there. Well, this little number, he's not too bad. I mean, the things I've had before, <laughs> Jesus Christ, they were awful. Um, but no, I, now, now we've opened up the, the can of worms. There's so much going on and there's so yeah. much you can learn about yourself and how you interact with the world from the solo multi-person question. But I, but I do think the shared experience of doing something great in a car uh, can't be beaten. Just can't be beaten. I love I mean, it. I'll so share, it. A, I'll share a photo after all by this. itself, didn't it? Sorry, there were two people talking. And managed Sorry, to... I was just saying it was so big, it became a Hollywood genre all by itself. I mean, the whole point of a buddy road movie is about two people who get in, they go for a journey, and they're both transformed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll Sorry. share a photo um, after this. Of, we drove from Monaco to San Sebastian, and uh, we'd just got Saki the Poodle. And uh, he was so excited to be in the car with us, pretty, pretty much for the nine hour drive. He had two legs on the rear seats and two legs on the front armrest the whole time, looking yeah. out the window in excitement to get there. <laughs> Dogs. Mm -hmm. Amazing. What? So, this is, I've got to word this carefully because it could go on forever. What's the factoid to, um, uh, to paraphrase the late great broadcaster that? Uh, you learned most recently that made you think I never knew that about the car world something motoring it can't just be about your own personality sexuality it's got to be about cars all right <laughs> let's keep it to there uh Edward you go first I can't drive flat out everywhere without getting in trouble what was the word I just used <laughs> best answer ever I actually took to Google to this because there, was, there wasn't anything that came to mind that I, I've learned. But here's, here's a couple of <laughs> couple, couple for you here. No washing cars in Switzerland on a Sunday. And Germany. Yeah. No drinking, including water, when driving in Cyprus. Really? Um, you can get a $5,000 fine or whatever the currency is in Moscow for driving around in a dirty car. Oh, I'm all um, for that. Uh, and th this one's kind of a Sorry, given. If you've been to Moscow in the winter, everything is everything well, is brown. Uh, yeah. uh, th this this is what I, this is what I learned, and this was an interesting one. Which this kind of makes total sense, but I wonder. I'm going to go and see if this works. But you can't pay with your phone in a drive-through in the UK. You can, but there's a. There's a really good guy who's a police officer who has an Instagram account. Who, yeah, Devon and Cornwall bloke. Yeah, and he's he's trying to explain it. There is a legal grey area, isn't there, about whether yeah. you, are you on a public highway? You're quite right, Edward. It's a good one, this. But I think it's a grey area. 
Yeah. Because if your engine's running at the door whilst you're picking up your burger and fries, um, you, your your car should be stationary with the engine off, I believe. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. that is that is right. I mean, this is a good example of the conversation of the time, how bad law ends up looking stupid. And that is a good yeah. example of where that law, which is a bad law, I think, because it's just so messy and contradictory to all the touchscreen stuff that's going on. And they've had to make this silly little dancing on a pinhead loop around, oh, yes, but what about drive throughs Because the whole world has gone to, nobody has a wallet anymore, they have these things. Oh, shit, didn't think of that. I yeah. don't understand the problem. It's not a public highway. You're off the public highway. It doesn't make any difference. Well, the law, this was another conversation at the time, but I, I saw the bloke because he, he does three or four videos a month about this stuff, yeah. explaining yeah. it. He's quite a good guy. I'm and he said, if there's, if there's a chain across, then it's not open to the public. But if there's no chain across, the law sees it as even though the land might be owned by a non-state player, yeah, the laws right. of the land for the highway apply. But I think that not drinking water in Cyprus, that is a bloody good factoid. That's really, yeah. that's really, really good. And, the, and just, just finally, because we're not doing uh, this week in cars, but I, I, I'm in Portugal and I rented a Mercedes GLE um, mm. from, from the airport and... Sometimes when you get off a flight and you're renting a car in a different country, you're always a bit frazzled and you're thinking you're going to do something wrong. But I had all the electrical aids on um, in the GLE. And actually, they're brilliant. Um, my little thumbs come up. It came down. I don't know why that. Um, yeah, but they're brilliant. These um, When you're in a country in a rental car, having all these uh, driver aids on, slowing your braking down, keeping you in the lane, etc., Highly recommended. Yes. Uh, Manish. Um, I'm going to resort to um, <laughs> a few little Indian regulations that I found, which I just thought are absolutely brilliant now. I'll revert to my earlier accent. Delhi High Court, in case related to traffic offences, had ordered to remove tinted glasses from all four wheelers as there were apprehensions that anti-social elements might misuse it to hide their identities. <laughs> <laughs> That's so a good no accent you've got glass, there. Okay. How about this? Smoking inside a car is a violation of traffic law. If somebody is found guilty of smoking inside a car, he stroke she will have to pay a fine of just 500 rupees. This is not only dangerous for the smoker, but also for other people sitting in a car or outside. That's true. Number three, use of high beam headlights at night will attract just 500 rupees fine. But according to reports, this is the main cause of road accidents and is considered very dangerous. <laughs> Whereas driving a vehicle at night without headlights will attract just a five to 15 rupee fine, which is a cruel joke. <laughs> and the, the last one, I love this, borrowing the car for a short while. This rule is applicable only in Chennai. As per this rule, if someone is using a borrowed vehicle, the owner should have a clear knowledge of the vehicle being borrowed. In case the police stops you and finds out that the owner had no clear knowledge of you borrowing their car, the offender can face three months in jail or a 500 rupee fine. The intent behind enforcing the said rule is to prevent cars from being stolen. <laughs> As thieves often escaped after citing the fact that they had just borrowed the car. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Oh, I love those. That's woken me up, that has. Neil Clifford, what factoid have you recently learned? Well, mine is completely different to you guys, and I'm rereading the question to see whether I've sort of fucked this up, but I don't think I... I know you haven't. No, it's, it's very broad. Yeah, it's very broad. Um, I didn't know, I've talked about this car before, that there was a road-going Porsche 917. <laughs> the, Count Rossi, the, the Count Rossi car which, as I've spoken about, is my favourite car of all time. But I didn't really know that car existed to about three or four years ago. And, you really? know, bring, bringing myself up on things like yeah. this, 
I, I, I felt a bit embarrassed that I didn't know. It about never it. appeared. It never appeared in any of those things. No, it was <laughs> never in. It was never written about. It was never in Car Magazine. It was never anywhere. <laughs> And the internet didn't exist in the 70s. So I was I was a little bit embarrassed and shocked that I didn't know about this car. And I had the fortunate luck, really, to spend time with that car, not in Retromobile, but um, recently in London, parked on the street. Um, and you've probably seen a lot of that now on Instagram, organised <clears throat> by the wonderful Joe Macari, and that car on the street in Old Bond Street, is probably quite possibly one of my peak seeing a car in real life experiences ever because this thing is beyond gorgeous there's you know that lovely 70s silver the beautiful perfect tan just the, and I didn't know that car existed and I was slightly embarrassed I've never admit that but I've never admitted it before that I was embarrassed I didn't know about it but I've admitted it now well there you go Neil Clifford yeah um, so, Chris Cooper. Coventry Climax. Hmm. Sounds, sounds like an unlikely set of circumstances, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> he thought about that and it was good. Yeah. He thought about yeah. that and it was good. I'll go home now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't know that tucked, I won't say precisely where, but it's quite close to Neil and, and, and me, tucked away just behind a little high street near us, it's a business that I've sort of known about for a long time, but I didn't know precisely where it was and how close. It's literally, I could see it. If I stand on top of the office, I can see it from here. It's a business called Classic Autos. Classic Autos is a family-owned business owned by the Finberg family. So the fin there's a 917 mm. link here as well. Uh, the Finberg that's, that's why you took it off the wall. That's where it is. The Finberg family owns one of those cars. Yeah, have a guess yeah. which one it is. Not the you know not, not, not the tubular one built in Dartford. No, sadly, because that means I'd have the other one. Yeah. Um, Mark Finberg, I uh, stood around. He, he's in mid eighties. He was a solicitor, and in fact, you've, that car's been everywhere. It's always a good one. Yeah, Festival of Speed or other stuff. He's still got his business card. In yeah. it's a nineteen eighties embossed beautiful old-fashioned business card which is still stuck it is sellotaped probably is sellotaped or a little glued in the top of the glass of the driver's gull wing door um classic autos is owned by the finberg family and nick finberg who is mark's nephew mark's dad is aubrey uh, they run this extraordinary business so the boys bumped into Nick at a Goodwood test day when they were running the Mini a few weeks ago. And Nick came up to him and said hello because they were, they were running the Mini there uh, without me. Mm. And said, come and have a, come, come and see us. And we didn't realise how close to us. So we spent Friday afternoon there. It was the most wonderful afternoon. They specialise in C types and D types, rebuilding them, restoring them, racing them. Quite big into E types. They've got... There's an English wheel. Does anyone know what an English wheel is? Yeah. Oh, is that the to bend the metal? Basically, yeah, it's panel. Yeah. So we had a really so I met their one of their apprentices, Joe, Joe Frankham. Joe Frankham won the Apprentice of the Year Award in last year's Octane Classic Motoring Awards, that big shindig. Neil, you've probably been to it a few times. Um uh -huh. beautiful, wonderful business. Lots of lovely people there. Tom, we met as well, showed us around. So my sort of factoid or thing I didn't, I didn't know that literally within walking distance from here, there is the most glorious little business, Classic Autos, owned by the Finberg family, run by Nick. By the end of the afternoon, as you could probably tell where this is going, I was thinking, well, look at all these lovely cars. And he said, well, you know, we've got this Mini we're running, and, well, we couldn't run anything. We could run an E-Type. So I'm sort of... <laughs> we had the family conference, and I suspect this weekend, looking at all the lovely pre so pre sixty three or semi or semi lightweight, don't know. But so watch this space. But yeah, so I had no idea so close to us. Now I know it's that close. When Lynn listens to this, she'll just have her head in her hands. Yeah. So <laughs> anyone, that's 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 anyone that has a wife that listens to this is in a good place anyway. So don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, I love the fact that this is roamed all over the place. I'm not going to be able to match you on factoids, but the one that made me go, I never thought about that in the most embarrassing way. And let's face it, some of these are ones where you have to style it out. Yeah. When you're presented with the facts and you realise that everyone else in the room knew that and you thought, I didn't know that and I should really have known that, was reminds me of the fact that I'm trying to set up a, uh, a celebration of 25 years of GT3 at the moment with a certain car company. It's 25 years since the GT3 was launched, the Porsche. Um, and I drove the first one back to the UK. Uh, and I remember collecting it from Velk Eins in mm. uh, Zuffenhausen. And I got in the car. I mean, talk about a trip on your own. <laughs> drove it all the way back. And someone paid me to do 185 miles an hour on the autobahn to bring it back to the <clears throat> auto car. I think that was in July 99. What colour? It's guards red. Oh, uh, and I've got and I all you know pre digital cameras. All I've got is a load of those those Fuji ones that were green, the cardboard ones. I took two of those, and I've got the photos somewhere. It's one of the best things I've ever done. I was just driving around going, "Is this really me?" And I drove to a I drove to a garage called Dick Lovett Swindon, and I bought my first nine eleven in it because I was just I I just decided this was my life. Um. And I had saved up, don't worry, I wasn't, I didn't have the spur of the money and resources to do that. Anyhow, during the road test shoot, I wasn't as good at sliding cars then as I am now. And I wrecked one of the rear tyres and delaminated. And I went down to, I had to get the car back to Germany four days later. And I only had three tyres on the car. So I phoned up Mitchell Diva, as they were still are. Then they, it was just called yes. Mitchell, now it's Pro Tire. But yes. Mitchell Diva were and are the best. For some reason, somewhere near Amesbury, yeah. Wiltshire is the best selection of rubber in the UK. If you need it, it's there. Yeah. So I phoned them up and said, have you got a tire? They went, no, because that, that tire isn't on, on the system yet. We know it's coming. Why would you need one? I didn't want to explain that. Because then what, phoning up Porsche GB and saying, there's a GT3 in the country you don't know about, and it's missing a tire. So I, I then said, well, can I, have you got a similar size? Well, have you, got, have you got that size? I need to get it back to Germany. And they said, yeah, we've got that size, but it's not N-rated. I said, doesn't matter about the N-rating for this. N-rating, for those that don't know, is a Porsche-specific tyre. If you've got a Pirelli or a Michelin or a Dunlop, whatever it is, if Porsche have homologated that tyre, it'll have an N on the side of it. There's another factoid that you might not know. Most people know about it now. And that means that that tyre has been developed especially for that car. Mm. Anyhow, long story short, he then goes... But it's got the it's got I've got one, but it's the wrong load rating. And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't know, I didn't know that the last. If you look at your tire, it'll say something like fifty eight Y. There'll be two numbers and a letter at the end of your tire, yeah. and that's the load rating. That's the weight of the car. So you can have the same tire, but it can be for vehicles of vastly different weight and if you put one with the wrong load rating on it you've got a sidewall that's much much stiffer and it will totally bollocks the ride of your car up and i can tell you that a gt3 that's got one load rating on one side of the rear and another on the other side is a right bastard to drive at 180 <laughs> going through because it, 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 like, it's like a drunk scotsman you're like it's on the piss the whole time so um I had, and I can remember when they were explaining load rates, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not have a freaking clue. <laughs> I didn't. About, but now I do. Did you, uh, did you fess up when you delivered the car back? Uh, I got a snotogram from the German saying that there was, un I remember the wording, there was unconventional rear tyres on the car. <laughs> But um, <coughs> I, also, I also shamefully remember, and I found the photo the other day. I've seen I've got it on my I'm on my phone quickly. If I can bring it up quickly, I, I in those days, if a car came on SGO plates, you know those German plates, you would yeah. rather than leave them on because they were cool. We would take them off to make the car look like it was a UK car and put on a British plate. And in those days, you could just walk into Halfords without a V5, but they make any plate. Yeah. What you need to know is that for the road test of that vehicle, you can't quite see it. The last three yeah. left of the number plate are CJH, which has nothing to do with Christopher James Harris. Yeah. <laughs> I put my own initials. That's brilliant. On the Can you send plate. us that? I was about I was about eight months into working at Autocon. I was putting my own name on number plates for the photo <laughs> shots. Absolute tit. Um, right, moving on. That's pretty good. Um, let's do our two car garage. I'm gonna have to, but someone, uh, Edward, tell a story while I find this. 
Um, Chris, wait, hold on a second. You've just go into your WhatsApp. You've got it there. Um, it what I could say to fill, fill the void is, uh, Monkey, if you do need um, some number plates made up, we've got a bloke locally here. We'll do it, you know. No question, uh, nice. so. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. You're the son of Doris, who is now getting on a bit. This is familiar to my life. But in her prime was a Group B rally champion. I'm not sure, I'm not sure Michelle would like being called Doris, but she needs your help sourcing two vehicles. She has since retired from rally fame to the quaint town of Borton on the Water. This is I so love cool. Borton on the Water. She needs a car that won't look out of place in the car park of St Lawrence's Church or ruffle the feathers of her fellow churchgoers. However, it needs to pack a punch and she doesn't like to dilly-dally. <laughs> Whoever wrote this is just spot on. For her second car, she'd like to relive her youth and have a rally legend to make full use of the B-roads out in the Cotswolds. She has a budget of 80k. So you've got, wow. to, you've got to have a a rally legend and a this is david david o presto 94 fantastic so you got 80 grand this is a tough ask neil clifford no it's easy this one it's easy um, yeah. but bought and on the water it's got to be a volvo but she wants the most unassuming fast volvo it isn't. I'm not going uh, 850 TR5 thing. I'm going the the uh, more understated. Another car I didn't really know existed actually for a while ago. The V70R, the yeah. automatic one. I think they were only in automatic actually. Um, they had there was a manual older one, and then the, there was a manual yeah. older one. But I'm told the Series Two is the one to have. Um, yeah, which is awesome. They're they're about ten grand for a really 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 good one. Um, and no one, almost me, doesn't know what this car is, but it's got 200 odd horsepower, um, cool little thing. And so that I'd get that. And then, then what do you get? It's really hard, the, the rally one. I'm going Subaru because I didn't like the Mitsubishi. I never got on with that. I can't afford a T16. I can't go Group B completely. I can't get an Audi Quattro Sport. I can't get an RS200. You don't want a 6R4 because they're shit. So you're, you're going to go 15 grand. You used to be able to get a P1, you know, 2000 and bloody 13, 14, couldn't you? A P1 Subaru, even, they were 7995, weren't they, in top mark? But now they're like 30 grand. But I'm saving loads of money. She's got 40 grand to go on a cruise to, you know, around the world, actually. So I'm saving her 40 grand. She's got a P1 Subaru and a V70R Volvo. Beat that, I would love it. You're going to struggle. Well, Volvo's a good call. They're, they're the only two-wheel drive, though. They're front-wheel drive, aren't they, those Volvos? Um, That's front-wheel drive. My doesn't front matter. She yeah. just wants speed for the first car. Oh. It gets cold up there, and you know it's it's it's, <laughs> it's difficult. She's going to get. She might get stuck on the drive trying to get to church. So, Subaru uh, Forester STI, I think, is going to be her nice. her, ch her church car. Yeah, that's also boxy but good in the Volvo expression. And then I was struggling with the Group B car for the moment, and I remember back to one of the very first cars that we sold on collecting cars. Um, which was an Opal Manta Group oh. B homologation special. Oh, um, yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly find a photo of it now. Um, yeah. But I could see... You can buy, Manta, can you buy, if you can buy a Manta 400 with what you've got left over there, I need to know where that car is. I'll buy it tomorrow. Well, I'm going to get you a photo of it now, Christopher, just to pacify you. That's um, a cool car. Anyway, you, you carry on. I'll find a photo for it. Okay, so anyway, it's I think, STI, I think Do STI. Doris is going to be very happy in that. And is it in Astoria? Here we go. Look How much that. was that? 57 grand. No. Yeah. 57 and a half grand. Yeah. Okay, Amanda, four, what a car. Manta 400. Okay, I hate to say it, Neil. He's beaten you there. Yeah, I'd agree um, with you. Uh, Chris Cooper. Uh, well, I might have won this. Um, so I think in Borton on the Water... Nothing says don't scare the neighbours more or better than a little Mercedes A-Class, clear glass, no writing on anywhere over it, you know, but you could have, and I have to say, 
I went to the resources of collecting cars for this. List for free, sell for free, hassle free. Yes. Uh, yes. And I found this. <laughs> and I found that. You're, you've got some... A35. Oh, there you go, yep. A35. Yep. Uh, clear glass, 22,750. Hmm. I'll still look at that and think that's just a lot of car. And I yep. thought, well, so that would keep her going around Borton on the water. And she'd have a lovely session, Borton on the water, pottering backwards and forwards with that. Um, but I was in the same lines as Edward here, uh, Group B. So this is also sold on collecting cars. Oh, oh look at that little Renault 5. Yeah, it's good. Though. Renault 5, it's a road car converted into, it's been, it's been converted by the right people, John Price, John Price rallying, done by the right people. It's a road car converted into rally car, 50 grand. So uh, Daily Doris in uh, her A-class would be very, very happy and all her neighbours would be happy. Um, but not dilly-dallying around Doris in her Renault 5 Turbo converted into proper rally car. I think she'd be cool. I think she'd be well sorted. Good. Well, at least, at least you've looked after her dilly-dally. Uh, Manish, uh, what would you be choosing? <laughs> I've actually done a film with Michelle Mouton and I've seen her drive and uh, none of that fire is out. But what I did notice and what I did talk to her about, because she was the women's ambassador for the FIA, was whether she loved chucking cars around as much now as she did back in the day. And she went, no, 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 like that. And I just wonder whether with Doris, what this is about is kind of being young again but without completely reliving her youth so mm. go with me on this and I, I think what this is about is it's the appearance of being a rally driver whilst being exactly her age and i think michelle Mouton, what year was she born i think is it 58 1958 mm. thing yeah. like that might even be a bit earlier than that um i'll look it up no wait i've got i must i must have that wrong by 10 years because of course she was uh flying in the kind of early 80s anyway the point is I think that um, the pokey car, to get it in navy blue with a black roof, would be a um, mini John Cooper Works, a three-door. Because that thing goes to 0 to 60 as fast as the 456, as far as I could say. I mean, they're amazingly pokey cars. And I think you take a mini to church, yeah, no one spots you. And then there was something that we did get Michelle to drive. It's derived from the Group B. It is the road version of it. But I saw her drive this car like she was driving in a rally. And it was just a 1985 Audi Quattro, which I think you can pick up for £50,000. It's not a Group B car. I know it's the kind of, you know, civilised cousin of a Group B car. But how you drive them. And we had to pay £500 for the oversteer she had at a certain stately home, taking out about five yards of turf. Because it's who's in the car, left you, mm, mm. and their attitude, and not the car. Um, these are all really good. Everyone's on it this week. Um, so, although I think I, I think there's still room for improvement. So, <laughs> I'm going to say that these we're talking about a sleeper. We're talking about we, we want a cue car. We want we want the ultimate cue car for the ultimate Q woman. Because let's face it, she's doing the flowers in the church, does a lot of local community work, she works in the local shop. No one knows that she used to take on Val Terrell on, uh, <laughs> on the stage yeah. of the populist rally. She, so she is Q herself, she's a sleeper. Mm. So what she wants is a C7 Audi S6 Avant, a car that was bought in in minute numbers. So the, everyone talks about the RS6, but there was an S6. It has the yes. narrow body of the normal car, but it has over 400 horsepower, still got a twin turbo V8 in it. And you cannot spot these bloody things. When you get smoked by one, you cannot, even if you know, you can't spot them. So, yeah. Much, but it's been to MTM again, like last week's RS6. And it's got about, it's about 550. It's covered in scratches. And it's got, to, it's got two things that are the most ultimate Q accessories. First of all, it has the National Trust membership sticker in the front window. That is always Q, <laughs> because that makes you think that's a, that's a real ditherer. And on the back, there's been some extra black plastic attached to the rear bumper lower down so that when her spaniel gets in the boot, it doesn't scuff it. Both of those things are incredibly, are incredibly cute. I'll just blow my nose. Hey, Pim's good to know. 
Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, the rally car, I'm with, I'm sort of with Neil. I love the sound of Subarus, but she wants to have a good laugh and she wants, she enjoys her driving. She understands the dynamics. She knows these Subarus just understeer when the gear change is a little bit annoying on them. So she's got an Evo 6 GSR, one of the UK cars bought in by uh, John Kirkham back in the day. And she mm. loves it. Bits. And she doesn't drive it that fast. It's got a standard exhaust. It wants any more noise. Yeah. But, but, and this is where we leave it open, her grandchildren have got their eyes on it because they know it's worth a few bobs. So they're trying to prize it out of grandma's hands at the moment. So for me, C7, S6, and uh, an Evo 6 GSR. No, nice. Are you driving your yeah. Subarus correctly, Chris? Because I'm guessing Neil doesn't have the same issues with understeering. No, no, I've never, I've never, I've never no. sit, ha, had this um, understeery thing. No, no, but then <laughs> Neil has a Neil has a subtler driving style than mine, and I and I think I need to learn something here. <laughs> Let's move on to this week. Uh, we're going to give some more favourite YouTube videos because people quite like those. So um, this old this old because I, I got start dragging on a bit. Going... I need go to go on, and get a flight. Go on, Edward, you go first. Very simple, rough, yellow bird, Nürburgring. Nice. Yeah, I can't argue with that. One of the best. One of the very best. Uh, we will put links up this week to these videos, okay, so you can see them. But uh, I'm going to go and get a. I'm going to go and get a flight. See you all later. Bye bye, Edward. Bye. Bye. See you again. Uh, bye. The uh, Stefan Rosa White Sox Nürburgring. Uh, yeah. Unbeatable. Can't really complain. Can't argue with that. So, um, uh, Manish Pandey. Um, I would urge you to go and find Clive James in Las Vegas. It was done in 1981. It was part of the kind of Clive James traveling series. Mm. You will laugh, you will cry, you will learn something. But he shoots the whole thing over the weekend that Bernie puts the very first Las Vegas Grand Prix together. And it is some of the stuff you'll see. You'll see PK racing against Andretti on this ridiculous circuit in a Datsun with Clyde James in the back, just about not throwing up. You'll see Croupier telling you how to beat the house and you'll see Bernie explaining how he created the Grand Prix. You'll see the press fighting with the local police. I mean, it literally is 58 minutes of hilarious time oh, count. 58, 58 minutes, right, that's gonna alter my choice. Uh, Neil Clifford. Mine's two minutes. Um, Vic Alford, Targa Florio, 1972. Ooh. Put that into oh. YouTube. I don't like <clears> circuits <throat> that are connected as in they go round and round and round. I love road circuits. I adore Sicily. It's my favourite place in the world, probably outside of being at home. And um, he keeps saying the 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 key the key to the Targa Florio is just go as fast as possible for as long as possible. That's it, isn't it? That's how you win races. Good advice. Uh, yeah, it's really good. Enjoy that. Two minutes of uh, 70s YouTube. <clears throat> uh, Chris Cooper. Raymond Baxter. Oh. There are two videos, two quite short videos. Uh, we'll put the links up. If you look for Raymond Baxter OBE, you'll find uh, a set of interviews done with his family and friends just after he died. And extraordinary man. He was a fighter pilot, a Spitfire pilot in the war, BBC technical aircraft, voice of farm air show, Amazing. voice of motor racing. There's a bit Tomorrow's in world. later in the video. Tomorrow's world. Yeah. Tomorrow's world, where we most of us known from. There's a bit later in the video where Michael Rod, who we all know as well, was talking about there were North York moors and very, very icy winter. And Michael said, Raymond, are you sure you're okay with this? And Raymond turned to him with that voice and said, dear boy, I won my class in the Monty. Ah, Race in the Monty ah, Rally 12 times. There's a bit in it, he, he, owned, he owned one of the little ships. And there's a, bit, there's a voiceover with him piloting this little ship thing somewhere on the South Coast. And I think these are words that made me think positively about our country and its future. In that voice, he said, we're British. We know what we're doing. We believe in what we're doing. And oh. I thought, I wish he was around today to say that. Yeah. The other one, the short clip, which I think is on Instagram, but we'll show the links, is his commentary of the first flight of Concord. Yeah, I've seen I mean, that. the hair's That's standing good. up on my neck oh. thinking about his voice. Yeah. And 
the, the, his immortal words, when it finally took off, he said, she flies. Yeah. Bring me back. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Lump in throat, we'll go and watch that. Uh, I've vacillated hugely on this. I've got, it makes me realize how much time I've spent probably on YouTube over the years, how much, despite the fact I have my issues with YouTube in its present format as someone who tries to broadcast on there and numbers go up and down randomly, we didn't have a resource like YouTube when we were younger. And the idea that, you know, you could maybe go to an encyclopedia or, or you could meet someone that or that could tell you about a story or you could maybe find a VHS cassette that someone could lend you. Mm. Now kids can just go Saturn 5, done, and just watch it. I think the internet is an evil thing, but it's also an amazing thing. Um, so yeah. I'm going to go for... Well, I've got go-tos. You might. I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. My the way my brain works, I do the same thing over and over again. And if I tonight, I know I'll probably might pour myself whiskey after I've seen my kids, and I'll probably watch an onboard of Patrick Depayet in the wet at Montreal because Montreal. I can't. I still think it's one of the best things ever filmed. I just love the driving. I love the fact that it. You can't quite tell if it's a circuit or a lake because it's so <laughs> yes. modern. And, the, and if you've ever driven a car with a DFV in it and that little steering angle, the way he drives the car is utterly mesmerising. But then it'll open the wormhole of other... They did a series of onboards that year, and if you go, you'll see some of the footage. It's just mental. But I think Depayet, Montreal, is just sensational. Go and watch it. It's, it's mega. Wonderful. Great choice. All right, guys. So I think that uh, wraps up episode 60. So that's one anniversary gone. We look forward to other anniversaries in the future. Thank you to my fellow podcasting addicts and we'll hopefully broadcast to you next week. Bye.